hard to believe it's only Thursday. Um, I have just one uh, item at the top on Afghanistan. As Secretary Kerry said in his op-ed yesterday, the time for politics is over. The time for cooperation is at hand. With cooperation among the campaigns, the international community, and Afghan authorities, this process can be concluded in a way that reflects the wishes and aspirations of the Afghan people. Uh, therefore, we welcome today's announcement by the Afghan Independent Election Commission, or the IEC, that the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan, or UNAMA, uh, that the IAC has adopted the recount and invalidation criteria proposed by the United Nations and based on Afghan law and international best practices. The audit is an immense undertaking, requiring hard work and commitment from many people involved. With the adoption of the invalidation criteria and the other efforts the IEC is making to improve the audit process, the audit must now move forward more quickly and efficiently. Now we urge both candidates to instruct their teams to participate fully and constructively in the audit when it resumes on August 2nd. Matt. That's it? On Afghanistan? That's it. Okay. Yep. Um, <clears throat> let's start with uh, the Middle East. Uh, your colleague at the White House <clears throat> just uh, in his briefing just concluded a little while ago uh -huh. um, said that there was little doubt as to whose artillery was to <clears throat> was responsible for the shelling of the UNRWA school the mm -hmm. other day in Gaza. And then he said that shelling of this facility was totally unacceptable, totally indefensible. Correct. And then new sentence said Israel mm -hmm. needs to do more to uh, protect civilians in Gaza. Um, the day before, yesterday, mm -hmm. so yesterday, you condemned the shelling of this facility. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if today's comments mean that you're prepared to actually use the sentence, the United States condemns Israel for its shelling of this school, or is that not where you're at right well, now? Well, I'll reiterate what my colleague said, uh, and let's just, let me just give a few data points here and then we can do some follow-ups. Uh, the Secretary General of the UN, Ban Ki-moon, said yesterday that, quote, all available evidence points to Israeli artillery as the cause, unquote. He further said that the coordinates of the school, like the UN facilities, like all UN facilities in Gaza, were repeatedly communicated to the Israeli Defense Forces. The UNRWA Commissioner General said UNRWA has gathered evidence, analyzed fragments, examined craters, and that their initial assessment is that it was Israeli artillery that hit the school in which 3,300 people had sought refuge. The Israeli government has acknowledged that Israeli forces were firing on that area in response to fire from Hamas in the immediate vicinity of the school. The Israelis have said it is possible that there was stray Israeli fire as well. So again, while we underscore, Matt, the importance of a full and prompt investigation of this incident, as well as the shelling of other UNRWA schools that have been hit, there is not a lot of doubt about whose artillery was involved in this incident. We condemn the shelling of this school as we would anywhere in the world. Uh, I would reiterate what my colleague Josh said. It is totally unacceptable and totally indefensible. Uh, that condemnation doesn't uh, equate or create any equivalence, I would say, uh, with a terrorist group that fires rockets indiscriminately from Israel. But I think uh, overnight we had looked at the situation more. As I said, we were gathering information and talking to our partners. Uh, and today we're able to go a little bit further than yesterday. Okay, but you're still not at the point where you are – are, are condemning Israel, or even less than that, just condemning Israel's shelling of, not condemning we've the whole We've condemned country. the shelling of the school, and we've said that okay. there is not a lot of doubt about whose I, artillery I, uh, was involved in this All right, incident. I don't want to play semantics with this, but... Uh, then maybe I, we no, shouldn't. No, I'm not going to. I'm going to actually okay. move on. Okay. Well, actually, are there any... Well, so, are there any policy implications for this? In what way? Well, I mean, is it business as usual with, with Israel after you well, condemned the show? from a policy perspective, what the Secretary has been focused on, even uh, as we speak right now, uh, is seeing if we can get <coughs> a ceasefire in place, uh, an unconditional uh, temporary <coughs> ceasefire in place. He continues to work towards that goal. Right. No, I'm not talking about that. <coughs> That's our I'm policy talking... goal at the moment. Yeah, but I mean overall U.S. relationship with Israel. Is there any consequence to the fact that this happened, or are you, will, are you saying this is a bad thing, we condemn it, but let's move on, everything else can remain normal? And I say this in the context of this approval mm -hmm. uh, last week or whenever it From was the of, the, of, right, mm -hmm. of the additional um, uh, ammunition that, mm -hmm. that, that, that they're getting. Well, both things can be true. We've always said we will support uh, the Israeli government. We will help it uh, in its efforts to defend itself. But when we feel uh, that there are more steps that can be taken, we will also say that. 
So they're not either or. Both are true in this case right. as well. Uh, in the in the DOD um, mm -hmm. talking points that came out last yesterday uh -huh. about this, it said that this was a routine request. It went through the normal interagency process and was passed along. So I'm just wondering, um, the, the State Department here, you have several bureaus that are involved in this That's interagency true. process. Mm -hmm. do, you, are you, do you know at if, if any point during the, the review at the State Department, if even a concern, if any concerns were raised about, about this transfer? I, I am happy to check. I'm not aware of the internal discussions that were had around this uh, until the decision was made, but I can okay. check with our I mean, clearly, Not if, to my knowledge, but okay. I can check. Okay, so you, the people who are responsible for monitoring the various mm -hmm. regulations or restrictions surrounding transfers of, of weapons like this, even to an ally like Israel, mm -hmm. you're not aware if they raise any concern about I'm just not aware of the concern. content of the internal deliberations. Okay. Can I ask whether you've uh, raised uh -huh. your concerns about this shelling uh, yesterday on the school directly with Israel? I mean, you just said it was indefensible. Have uh -huh. you raised it with Israel? Have you asked for an explanation? I can check and see if that's come up specifically. We've obviously had a number of diplomatic conversations with the Israelis as part of our attempts to get a ceasefire in place. I don't know if that's been part of the discussion specifically. And I wondered whether yesterday you made a comment about fears that there could be tens of thousands of Gazans stranded mm -hmm. on the streets um, if... Um, UN uh, facilities are becoming a target and they have nowhere to go. Have you raised that issue directly as well with the Israelis, that they need to improve? If they're going to do, continue this bombing, this shelling campaign, if that they have to sharpen somehow the messages to people to, get, to be able to seek safety? Well, and just for some numbers, we do think that there are now more than uh, 250,000 Palestinian civilians in Gaza displaced. That's about 13 percent of the population. Uh, we believe that more than 220,000 of those are now seeking shelters in 85 UN schools in Gaza. So just so we have some stati some statistics here. And two more points I would make. The first is that Israeli policy is to avoid civilian casualties. So uh, they undertake steps to do this. We believe they could do more. Uh, but we don't want to in any way equate a country who takes steps to protect civilians with a terrorist group that intentionally targets civilians. So I want to be very clear about that. And secondly, I would make the point uh, that we have had these discussions broadly uh, with the Israelis about the fact that there are so many Palestinians displaced. Uh, we've had that conversation. Again, all of the concerns that are raised around these kinds of incidents are why the Secretary is working towards a ceasefire, particularly if we can get a humanitarian ceasefire in place so we can get food and medicine and supplies into Gaza to these 250,000 civilians and others who are, are suffering here. Are you prepared to go further than you were yesterday and say that UN facilities should not be targets in this uh, Well, we've been conflict. clear that UN facilities are neutral. The UN is neutral. Uh, it's, you know, we, we don't uh, want to make a blanket statement about every hypothetical in the future, period, obviously, but uh, the UN is neutral. Their facilities are where people seek refuge. I can't envision a situation uh, where we wouldn't condemn an attack on a UN facility, but again, I don't want to make a blanket statement about every hypothetical that could, that could well, Unless you know, a rise in the future. Unless presumably, as you've contended, that mm -hmm. Hamas militants are hidden rockets in that exactly. facility. That's, the, so that's why I don't want to make a blanket statement here. Okay. You, you, you just said UN facilities are neutral. The UN is neutral. UN well, it, there, there are a lot of people in Israel who don't take that view um, and say that... Well, I would that, disagree with those who uh, don't take oh, that Okay, view. but say that the UN, and specifically UNRWA, has allowed or uh, not prevented, shall we say, or not done enough to prevent... Hamas from taking over these facilities. Well, UNRWA so, is an unarmed well, humanitarian you, organization. I, well, I it's understand. not equipped to fight back against Hamas trying to store rockets. Well, I in understand their that, but if there's a uh, if there's an UNRWA facility where there are Hamas rockets exactly, stored and Matt. fighters there, and I'm not sure. Hold said, on, wait, wait. I don't see how you can call that neutral. Well, that's not the UN supporting Hamas. That's a UN facility I, being being taken advantage of by Hamas by Hamas. Yeah, but, when the UN has no ability to fight but back. But you said your line was UN facilities are neutral. They are neutral areas, and they should be treated as such by anyone, by including everyone. Hamas. Okay, but so if that's, they're not by Hamas, so that's why I'm not going to make a blanket statement. I understand that, but if they're not by Hamas, the Israelis say, I mean, if there are weapons there, Hamas, I mean, Israel says they're a legitimate target. You agree with that, yeah, or no? I'm sorry, with what? <clears throat> in a situation, Sorry, you know, yeah. in a situation where you have a UNRWA facility, whether it's a school or a hospital or what, whatever it is, that's been taken over by Hamas, or where there's st they're storing their rockets, mm -hmm. the Israelis say that that's a legitimate target. I think we would look is at that, each one individually before making an assessment about whether that was. Okay, a legitimate you don't necessarily target. disagree with with that. I don't disagree with the notion that where there are rockets stored. 
that's not a threat to Israel, right? right? So again, I don't okay. want to make blanket statements for exactly this reason. It's right. complicated. Okay. So, so when you said UN facilities are neutral, you should uh, that, that well, no. wasn't meant to be a blanket statement. Well, no, the UN, the UN is a the principle of UN neutrality is incredibly that. important. Yes, I got that. So, I mean, no one should take advantage of UN facilities and their neutrality, un especially Hamas. Understood. To store but circumstances there because that puts the UN at risk. But circumstances can change where a UN facility is not neutral if the UN is not there, right? I mean, if they abandon in, something. In theory, then, uh, yes, in theory. <laughs> Facility, if a UN facility is neutral, if the UN is neutral mm -hmm. and a facility is considered as, an, as neutral, mm -hmm. then there shouldn't be deliberate attacks on those facilities. I just condemn the shelling of this facility along those exact lines. So, right. Right, but you won't say that Israel, that, that Israel shouldn't target or anyone shouldn't target. Israel. We're saying no one should use UN facilities and put them in the crossfire of conflict here. Now, this all started, let's remember, because Hamas began storing rockets in UN facilities. We understand that, but well, just to get it's an important point to make. Yeah. 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 No, it's an important point to make. We have seen, yes, Said, we have seen, we have seen Hamas storing rockets in UN schools. Yes, we have. That We've talked a couple times about UNRWA uh, finding the... I've heard of, uh, of uh, rockets being stored in Hama facilities. Saeed, UNRWA came gone. out twice in the past two weeks and said they had found caches of Hamas rockets in their right. schools. But they're, we not, talked, they're not rocketing them. Sorry. They are storing no. rockets okay. in them. So that's a different so, the other, yeah. so then my follow-up is um, the, UN, the top UN human rights official mm -hmm. today said um, she believed Israel was deliberately defying international law in its uh, military offensive in Gaza. Would you agree with that? Well, um, I'm not going to make an international legal judgment here. A few points I would make, though. Uh, it is Israel's policy to do what they can to prevent civilian casualties. As I've said, we believe they should do more. We also believe they have a legitimate right to defend themselves against a terrorist group who is sending rockets across the border and trying to kill innocent Israeli civilians. So uh, the right to self-defense is clearly an important part uh, of what we think is at play here. And do you think that um, by giving the Israelis additional military equipment, um, uh, as was announced by DOD, mm -hmm. would prolong or, you know, or worsen this conflict? No, look, we have a very long-standing, well-known military-to-military relationship with Israel, uh, period, because we believe it's important, incredibly important, for our countries to have one. But I, again, if you look at what the U.S. government's main focus is right now in terms of policy on this conflict, it's not the resupply to the Israeli government. It's Secretary Kerry and others working very hard to get a ceasefire in place to stop the fighting right now. So our policy uh, is focused uh, so much right now on trying to get a ceasefire in place. And how close are you to announcing that ceasefire? How close do you think that you know that's that's is? a that's a guessing game that uh, I don't even want to do you to, feel to that venture a percentage at? I think we have had some. Some progress. I think Secretary's made some progress. These are very complicated issues. He continues working. Uh, look, we would like to get one in place as soon as possible. So well, we'll see uh, what happens in the conversation. Don't you think that, you know, obviously the Secretary is working very hard at that, <laughs> mm -hmm. but by kind of continuing to resupply ammunition that is being used in this conflict, would you say that you're concerned about the civilian deaths, most of which these deaths are civilian deaths, but don't you think that those two aims are working at cross purposes? Not at all. How do you think that continuing yeah. to supply... I'll answer when you're done. Uh, okay. How do you can mm -hmm. think that continuing to supply ammunition is not furthering this conflict? Because that's a simplistic reading of what this military-to-military -military relationship is like. Resu we resupply allies and partners and friends that we have a military-to-military -military relationship with uh, when there are requests to do so. That is an ongoing process and a fairly routine process. That's, has, you know, that doesn't in any way further the conflict. It's a routine process we have when we supply our partners and allies with, with items that we have provided them in the past. But when, you, um, uh -huh. when the Egyptians were um, cracking down the um, civilian population of earlier this year or last year, mm -hmm. um, you quietly suspended resupply to them. They're wholly different situations. Well, why is it totally different? Whole, wholly different situations. Our relationship with Israel, our military-to-military -military relationship is, is uh, a very strong one. I'm not saying that it's not strong, but okay. isn't part of that strength? It's very different than the one with Egypt, where, as Fine. you know, we suspended a large amount of assistance after what happened politically in Egypt. Fine, but isn't part of that strength of the relationship being able to say that we think that 
Um, that they should do the more? asymmetry of this conflict is getting out of hand. Well, we and have said that very clearly. So, to but them, by continuing, you're saying that, but by <laughs> continuing to supply them with ammunition, because we believe it's an important relationship, and we believe it's important for our military. Well, it's not uh, a to work with their military. but supplying them with ammunition is not kind of done in a symbolic way to say that I'm a good friend of Israel. It's done for specific purposes well, to... To say we're committed to the security of Israel. We have always said that. We can do both things at the same time. Marie, well, you do you understand about. how it sounds when you come out and say that supplying one side of a conflict with weapons, not to say that you shouldn't, but that supplying one side of the conflict with more ammunition does not meet, does not... Uh, prolong the, the conflict or is in no way possible, it can't possibly prolong the conflict. That just doesn't make any sense. Well, I don't think that whatever these it may you be know, tank rounds and illumination rounds we provide in resupply are not the decisive factors here in this no, conflict. No, well, probably, you know, probably not, but I don't right. know exactly what they are. Not decisive factor, but that doesn't well, mean giving right, one I, side I, of a conflict more ammunition can't not help but possibly prolong it. It's not, I, a, it's no, not a ridiculous... No, because the strategic uh, and tactical decision the Israelis make about whether to accept a ceasefire and enter into one, I don't think is, is influenced by whether we give them some ammunition okay. tank rounds. All right, well, do you know... I think have that's they said like that apples and oranges here. Have they said that they're not going to use this latest ba batch of stuff that you're giving them in the current conflict? Well, any... Uh, I would check with DOD about that, first of okay. all. Any well, I mean, if they've given you that assurance... can obviously be used for offensive or defensive purposes. Um, I don't know what the specific conversations look like, but again, the notion that because we've provided, you know, some tank rounds and illumination rounds, that somehow that would, you know, influence their calculations about whether to accept a ceasefire is just well, a little bit nonsensical. I think. Well, I, can I, can we, can we do one at a time, guys? Are you talking to the Israelis can we do about one at a time, guys? Please. Do you not worry about the optics Thank of um, American-supplied ammunition? Being used in 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 Gaza I, I and possibly causing even more deaths. Does that not in, in a situation where the American reputation in the Arab world is already not great? Well, do you not worry about those optics? A, a few points. It's not look. It's not optics we're worried about. We're worried about civilian casualties, regardless of what uh, ammunition is used in this conflict. So we have always said it's not it's not in any way breaking news to people that we have a very close security relationship with Israel and that we supply them. Uh, with weapons, we talk about it very openly. That's not new. That's not a surprise to anyone. I think what you've seen over the past few weeks and even just the past 24 hours is we have very strongly uh, and increasingly come out and said the Israelis need to do more. When we've talked about this school, we have said more uh, when we are able to. And I think, quite frankly, that's the message we're discussing right now. And I do think we can do both at the same time. But, Marie, but if you, on a policy, from a policy perspective, mm -hmm. when you just said and answered at least this question, how different it is from Egypt, can you explain how it is? Because at the time, I remember State Department saying that we have a very strong military military relationship with the Egyptian military. It's very specific as to what we give them and the purposes for right. the the foreign military sales and how they're structured. It's holy totally But it took this, the administration took a long time and then finally suspended delivery of items, specifically because they were upset about how those items were being used against a civilian population. That's so right. how there was a lot of is, play in those decisions made about the Egyptian assistance. That's part of it. Right. How those items were being used. That's certainly part of it, but this was a much broader conversation. But how, why is that wholly different from what we're looking at now in terms of weapons being used against a civilian population, which you've said is a concern to the Well, in Egypt, they were using them against their own people. In Israel, they are using them against a terrorist organization to fight a terrorist organization, which we believe is in legitimate self-defense. That's different. But causing a, mass civilian casualties. Which we said they need to take more steps to... To, to lower those numbers. But using so, a, those supplies are, that the United States is I, I understand to the crux of your question, but they're not comparable situations. In Egypt, you had a government cracking down on its own people. In Israel, you have a government fighting an external threat uh, that's coming from Gaza uh, that is from a terrorist organization. Those are in no way equivalent situations. Yes, Saeed. Right. Uh, on the issue of condemnation, you're not backtracking. You're not walking back from using the word Condemn. I think because I actually went further today. I understand. I just want to understand you clearly because mm -hmm. yesterday you did not assign blame. Today you seem to be certain as to who is responsible. There is not a so lot of So you condemn doubt. Israel yes. for shelling that school. Correct? I just made very clear at the beginning that we condemn mm -hmm. the shelling of the school and that there's not a lot of doubt about whose artillery it was. Okay. And now you, you also said that Israel is doing all it can 
or it's doing all it can. Yes, that's, I think that's what you said. That's not what I said. Okay. I said they could do more. Israel, it's the opposite of what I said, actually. Okay. Israel is doing something to minimize civilian casualties. They are, but we believe they the could Palestine, do more. While on the other side, those who are firing rockets are not taking that into consideration. You know how many civilian Israeli civilians were killed by these rockets versus how many civilians were killed by artillery and bombing of Israel? I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but okay. I do know they are fairly lopsided. Okay, yes. they're, they're fairly lopsided. So uh, Israel is not really taking your counseling or your, your for them to take caution or to, you know, as, as in the case, as in the, case of the school. Because we believe they should they take more steps. 17 times. We will keep... Okay. Telling them they should take more steps. Uh, let, let me just quickly follow up yeah, on, and then, on oh, the let's issue let's of the humanitarian issue. UNRWA is saying that Gaza is on the verge of collapse. There is no power. There is no water. You know the, the hospitals are not working. We're going on very minimal uh, power supply. That everything is falling apart. Are you concerned that we are maybe on on the verge of a huge human catastrophe there? Well, I certainly believe that there is a huge humanitarian uh, issue in Gaza right now. This is exactly why we want a humanitarian ceasefire in place. Mm -hmm. So we can get uh, medicine, we can get supplies, but also so we can have some time and space to negotiate a longer term, more lasting ceasefire, like we've talked about, which will be the thing that ultimately <laughs> helps the most with the humanitarian situation. At the present time, stop the when, fighting. When, when the Secretary is, uh, is busy, of course, traveling and has other items on his agenda, big items, uh, who's wrapping up anyone, quite is, a phone bill to the Middle right, East, I can I assure you that. So is he engaged, or is anyone in particular engaged in the process of uh, ar arranging for a ceasefire? Yes, the Secretary has spoken with the Qatari Foreign Minister numerous times today, with his senior Israeli officials as well, including the Prime Minister, also with our colleagues at the UN, uh, the Special Coordinator for Middle East Peace, uh, Sari. He's uh, spoken with him several times as well. So he has been very engaged. I actually wasn't making a joke about that phone bill. He's been on the phone mm -hmm. quite a number of times in between a full uh, schedule of meetings in India. Mm -hmm. And you know, the that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu isn't really prepared yet for a ceasefire. He came out today and said that they are going to press ahead and destroy all the tunnels. Well, look, we, we know we're not there yet, but I think we have made some progress. And again, the Secretary is very engaged in it, and hopefully soon, We'll be able to get something uh, temporary. What kind of progress do you think you made? You know, it's always hard to quantify, but we believe we are getting closer, and hopefully soon we'll be able to to make some. And on the other side, who's working? Here. Who's working with the Hamas? I mean, the, have the Qataris stepped up? Are they are they doing that? It's my understanding that the uh, the Qataris are, the Turks are as well. The Egyptians obviously would be the convening uh, party for <coughs> any longer term negotiation that could happen after an intermediate or temporary ceasefire. Can we get back to the idea of you know more um, care um, mm -hmm. on the um, on the targeting? I'm just wondering, you know, it's it seems like it's not kind of the precision military targeting that you have kind of urged the Israelis to do, it seems like it's not specifically aimed at avoiding civilians. It's a kind of, you know, it's using long-distance weapons aimed at points that they say that they see firing upon without kind of that careful determination about who, you know, could be hit in the crossfire. I mean, that's is that what you're talking to? That's a pretty Israelis? broad statement to Well, make. it's a pretty broad, I mean, it's pretty obvious that you know, have these, you analyzed every single Israeli strike and operation? No, but I've seen about six or seven instances where mm -hmm. the Israelis have said that they saw rocket fire coming from that area, and it, and the targets that ended up being hit were not legitimate Hamas targets. Well, I, I think a couple of points, Elise, and this is something I sort of alluded to yesterday. Uh, Gaza is an incredibly densely populated area. And that's not an excuse, it's just a fact. And so when we've talked about how we take steps to prevent civilian casualties, often we're operating in very different mm -hmm. environments where Quite frankly, there's not that many places in the world that are as densely populated as Gaza. Uh, so that's point A. Point B, um, look, this is a, a threat the Israelis have looked at very closely when you talk about the tunnels, when you talk about the rockets. And we know that they have certain uh, precise capabilities to go after this threat. We do believe they could be taking more care with civilian casualties. And that you think they could be more precise in the targeting? Well, I mean, certainly that's part of it, right? That's part of how you take care to avoid civilian casualties, precision of targeting, advance warning uh, to populations that may be at risk, places for them to go. I mean, when you have huge amounts of displaced people that are already displaced, where do you go, even if you're warned? So there's a whole number of things that go into that. Well, there are, there are places Taking for them to go, but then those places are being targeted exactly. also. No, exactly. So there's, it's not just the precision of the targeting is what I'm saying. There are a number of factors that go into protecting civilians in these conflicts. Um, 
those are all factors at play here that we think we could be doing. I asked, let me, one more. I asked this the other day, but is there any thought given the fact that these, it is so densely populated, mm -hmm. that these people have nowhere to go, that even the places that they are going as shelters are being targeted. Is there any consideration of any type of, um, you know, safe haven places where you can send these refugees? Outside of Gaza? Either outside of Gaza or inside of Gaza or just some kind of safe haven well, where there is a you know recognition that this will not be a target and this is a safe place, whether it's inside of Gaza whether, or it's in a neighboring place. Mm -hmm. um, well, the UN know, has tried know. that inside of Gaza. So they're trying and they're working at this, but unfortunately we've seen um, folks that are have gone to these facilities unfortunately come under fire as well. In terms of other countries in the region, look, they've there's a long history with other countries in the region. Um, you know, bearing a, a burden of Palestinian refugees, and not just Palestinians now, Syrians, Iraqis, we've seen this throughout, you know, the countries in the region are already dealing with a number of refugees, so I haven't heard discussion about that. But look, we believe there should be safe places for civilians in Gaza. And would you Here say, you well, are you prepared to call on the Israelis not to attack any of those safe places, not to, not to target, not to shell these safe places at all? Well, I would like to see how we yes. define safe places, but certainly well, if there are identified places where civilians are told to go to be safe, exactly. no one, no right. one should attack them. Has it, I think that... All right. Can I go back to what your, to your, your, your explanation of the difference between Israel now and Egypt? Before, that was one explanation. And Egypt before, uh -huh. or one explanation of it. One piece it's, of it. See, you seem to say that in, the, the context was different because in Egypt, the Egyptian military was going after its own civilians, uh, or Egyptians. And Correct. that Israel is different because it's defending itself from an outside threat. Egypt was also threat. cracking down on peaceful protesters. Israel is going after a terrorist organization that's firing. I understood. So can we just limit this to the civilian, innocent civilian casualties? Mm -hmm. Okay. There were some in Egypt, people who got Correct. caught up in the people who, as the government was cracking down mm -hmm. on violence or whatever, that people got caught up. Okay. I don't understand how it's okay for a government to shoot and kill its own people. I mean, it's not okay for a government to shoot and kill its own people, but it is okay no, to we kill innocent all civilian civilians. Casualties. No, all I'm saying is they're just not comparable situations, and we have called on the Israelis to take more steps to protect civilians in this conflict. Are they not comparable in terms of your arms transfer regulations, or are they not comparable at all? The situations are just actually not comparable at all. Okay. Some so, of the same principles may apply at times in both, but the situations are just not comparable. Mary, you, They're just not at all. Okay. Just indulge me on uh, Lisa's point, uh, and it, uh, it's a serious question. I mean, suppose you designate. Every question here. Yeah, is and I'm, I'm saying you know the, the, they can go. To, let's say you can designate an area on the beach, for instance, and say people can camp out there, mm -hmm. and this area should be should be designated as a safe haven. You can do it on the map. Is that a possibility? Well, I don't have anything specific about what the UN particularly is doing, but we do think there should be safe places for Palestinian civilians during this conflict. Yes, as a principle, we do. Cruise ships or something and put them out in the Mediterranean. Is anyone thinking about that kind of thing? Not that I've All heard right. of. Can I ask you, um, as it relates to um, the progress that you claim to have been making in terms of, uh, you said it was hard to quantify? Well, it's always hard to quantify until you get the result at the end that you yeah. want. You know, some might suggest that the pro that, that it's actually been, what, what's the opposite of progress? Regress. I don't think that anybody in the discussions diplomatically about getting a ceasefire in place would argue that. Some commentators may, but they're not in the room and don't well, know what the latest is. how about is. in terms of the situation on the ground? Wait, I was talking about the negotiations for a ceasefire. All right, so, but in terms that of was, what's... The word progress was But in terms that. of what's going on on the ground mm -hmm. as it relates to those ceasefire negotiations, those they, they have not accomplished anything, have they? Well, there's right. no ceasefire in place. Right, exactly. Right. So you have, so there is no progress. There's been progress... If wait, I'm wait, wait. There's been progress in the diplomatic discussions to get a ceasefire in place. We right. are further along today than we were yesterday. But, but on the ground, how that affects people, no, the situation is the but same. But if I'm a 10-year-old Palestinian kid in, 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 in Gaza or a 10-year-old Israeli, Israeli kid in, in yep. Ashkelon, mm -hmm. the situation is there's no progress. Well, right, because a ceasefire is a right. yes or no okay. proposition. It's a... So this is progress right. towards a 24-hour limited truce. Well, we'll yeah? see what it looks like. I don't want to put a time frame around what the temporary ceasefire might look like. There are a number of, a range of options. And when you say there's nobody in the room, 
but there is nobody in the room. This is all being on done. The phone. On, this is all being done on a phone. There is no face to face. Uh, I don't know who's. At, I mean, if other of our partners are meeting face to face, but it has been done on the phone. Is this, is that a mistake? Do you believe that no. there should be face to face? Well, we had a whole week of face to face meetings, and uh, and and that didn't achieve the outcome we wanted. And I, I do think that uh, look, the secretary tends to prefer face to face in person diplomacy, but can also get a lot done over the phone. Marie, is there any consideration? Um, on any level of reconsidering the delivery, not the contracts, but the delivery of any military supplies to Israel right now. I mean, it's not without precedent to withhold certain armaments because you don't like the way they're being used. Is that, that a policy consideration? I have not heard that, no. Um, Should it be one? I don't think that's a, a judgment I need to make from here. I think we've been clear that we are committed to our security relationship with Israel. Given that the secretary likes the face-to-face -face meetings, do you have anything to announce as far as him going from India? I do not. No. Okay. Can I go back to the broader Israel-U.S. relationship for a bit? Mm -hmm. Yesterday, you had some pretty pointed comments about criticism of the secretary from yes people, uh, from what well, I think what you called respected voices in Israel. Um, today, there is a, a large Christian group that has. Open, uh, buying full-page ads in the New York Times and, I guess, other publications, um, calling on the United States to stand up for Israel, to support Israel, and also encouraging its members, and they have a lot of members, it's quite a large group, um, to write letters to Secretary Kerry saying that they are deeply troubled by reports that you put the prestige of your office and our nation behind efforts to promote a ceasefire proposal that specifically addresses key Hamas demands while largely ignoring Israel's security requirements. Why is the Secretary ignore, uh, promoting a ceasefire effort that specifically addresses Hamas demands and ignores Israel's security well, that's, requirements? That's an, absurd, that's an absurd statement. And I think, you know... Uh, the so you're saying he's not? Correct. Well, why do they have this impression? I, you can ask them why they have this impression, but it is a misimpression. I think there's been a lot of rumor and insinuation and false information about the ideas the secretary has put on the table, all of which are designed to further Israel's security. That's why uh, we ha this administration has provided unprecedented support, unprecedented assistance, both militarily, financially. Uh, diplomatically to Israel. Including in the middle of this conflict, Including right? in the middle of this conflict. We have stood alone in support of Israel at the Human Rights Council. Mm -hmm. We have said we will continue standing up for them in the international community. And quite frankly, those kind of statements that wholly misrepresent the Secretary's uh, intentions and efforts do nothing to further the security of Israel well, because they are so blatantly false. And it's your understanding that the Israeli government, or at least Prime Minister Netanyahu and his, uh, and his representatives, mm -hmm share what you just said about the U.S. backing Israel, correct? They have certainly spoken as such publicly. I can let them speak for themselves. Right, okay. Well, would you think that, I mean, when you have such a large group like this um, who command some... There are a number of groups entitled to their opinion. Oh, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, would you, would you like to see the Israeli government tell their supporters here, or anywhere for that matter, um, that, 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 that they're impression is wrong that they that they should that they shouldn't be writing letters like well, this because think, they're not true I don't or think I want to tell the Israeli government what to say to people that support them I think the Israeli government and officials including yesterday ambassador Germer have come out and said mm -hmm. uh, the secretary is a friend carry as a friend of Israel right. uh, that he has stood by Israel and I think they've spoken for themselves you, on this you you talked a, a lot a, a bit yesterday about how you thought Israel is used as a political tool Often, or uh, sometimes is you mm -hmm. uh, support for Israel is used as a political way a partisan way to divide the country mm -hmm. Uh, is that the way? Is that w the way you look at a campaign like this? Well, given is it I a have, political campaign? Given I well, I'll show it to you. Seen, I'll give it to we you. We can do show and tell here. Sure. Um, look, no, I think I will say this. Um, having worked on this issue for a number of years now, it is amazing the number of Americans all over the country from all different political backgrounds, religious backgrounds, walks of life who support Israel. Mm -hmm. That's precisely why we don't think that support for Israel should be a partisan issue. Mm -hmm. Because across the board, you, you can choose to support Israel uh, in whatever way you think it is, is most appropriate and, and best for you. But that can't go hand in hand on any side 
uh, with misinformation, particularly not when so much of what Secretary Kerry has done is in support of Israel's security. In okay, this job. last one and on in this. The Senate, too. Last one on this. Yesterday, you talked about this trans the alleged translation. You said it was complete crap. I know that got a little pickup online. Uh, yeah, uh, so I'm just wondering if you I think. I said it a few times. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you would, you would use the same um, no. words to describe the reports <laughs> that these people say that they have seen <laughs> about. It's the secretary um, supporting Hamas. Well, and Jen actually Israel. spoke at length a few days ago in that lengthy topper, and I think this may be, and again, I don't know, but there were a lot of false uh, insinuations inf and information about a proposal, quote, mm -hmm. that the secretary had given to the Israelis uh, for a ceasefire. And I think a lot of the misinformation about what that proposal looked like stemmed from those stories a few days ago. And we would, of course, uh, completely reject any notion uh, that the secretary is doing anything to support Hamas here. Right. Would you call those reports I'm, complete I'm crap? I'm going to refrain from using that <laughs> forward-leaning term at the podium, probably. I would say that that at was least, not really a forward, Twitter, not so. really a forward-leaning term, more of a backward. More of an oh. informal. <laughs> okay, we're right. more of an I'm informal done. term. I'm done but, with but that. But I, you know, I, the the complete fabrication of that tra of that transcript yesterday, I, I wanted, and I think I did make quite clear what our position is on that. Uh, Anything else on Gaza? Uh, yeah, very quick follow-up on this very point. Mm -hmm. uh, the Israeli press is saying that uh, Secretary of State co called uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu stubborn and uh, who is just... That who did? Secretary of State Kerry, something that, way, that he's very stubborn <laughs> and so on. I have and no idea where the Israeli press gets some he, of the stuff, Said. Yeah, okay. <laughs> he has a very close relationship with the Prime Minister. <laughs> India. Someone actually joked that I should have a five-second delay on my briefings <laughs> after yesterday. Let's do Ebola, and then let's move on. <laughs> In other exciting and, and uh, uplifting, uplifting news. Yeah. Really? <laughs> you think just, that you're the, you've become the George Carlin of the administration? Someone just joked about that this morning. Anyways. Um, can you talk about efforts to evacuate um, Americans contracted with the disease and bring them back to the United States? Yes, so I think there has been some misreporting out there on this, so just let me turn to that very briefly. Uh, the State Department, together with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, who has the lead for the U.S. government in the Ebola situation, uh, is working to facilitate access to aviation services for medical evacuations for U.S. citizens directly affected by the current Ebola outbreak in West Africa. <coughs> Uh, if and when that happens, it has not happened yet. Uh, every precaution will be taken to move the patient safely and securely, to provide critical care en route, and to maintain strict isolation upon arrival in the United States. The, D the State Department's Office of Medical Services has deployed its Chief of Infectious Disease to West Africa in order to provide on-the-ground consultation and guidance to health unit staff regarding protective measures and case recognition as well. Uh, there's a host of other things we're doing, but uh, there has been some misreporting out there on whether people had actually begun. Uh, Would you mind putting out a list of what you've done? Uh, sure, we can see if we can put out in a more formal taken question. Uh, you know, we have we have provided a range of support through HHS, the CDC, USAID, the Department of Defense, other government agencies. We have provided personal protective equipment and other essential supplies public health messaging efforts, we've assisted in those, and of course provided technical experts. I believe the CDC, they had a press availability at 1 o'clock today where I believe they talked about 50 additional experts they would be sending, I think 50, double check me on that, um, that they would be sending as well. So we certainly have a lot of technical expertise we can provide here. Do you have any advice to, um, well, your embassies for staff and your staff that are on the ground, but more broadly any Americans that happen to be in these countries yes. that are affected? So let me do a little bit on that. Hold on. We do not have any plans at this time to reduce embassy staff in any of these areas. We will continue to monitor the situation. There's also been a little misinformation out there on this. Let me get you a little bit on. I missed that misinformation on what? There's been, there are no plans at this time to, what did I say, uh, reduce the embassy staff in any of these locations. Uh, in terms of a travel warning, the CDC today issued a level three travel warning for Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra, Le Sierra Leone. Uh, it's a recommendation that people avoid non-essential travel to those three locations. Those that must travel, such as for humanitarian aid work in response to the outbreak, are urged to protect themselves by following the CDC's advice uh, for contact with people who are ill with Ebola. Uh, we will update our information on our country-specific <coughs> web pages. This doesn't trigger any sort of State Department travel warning, uh, but obviously we will include this in our travel information online. Uh, because the CDC has the lead for infectious Give, disease warnings. Given that Liberia has closed its schools, mm -hmm. particularly, 
um, after having already closed its land borders. I wonder if you're, even if you're not reducing embassy staff, are you closing the embassy for visas or? We're not, we're not, mm. we're not. There's you're been not. no change in our status. Yeah. Any As of those it relates embassies. to the summit that's coming up yes. uh, next week, mm -hmm. um, there are a couple leaders who have decided yes. against coming. Can you, which ones are those? So, are those the three? Uh, no. So we, uh, Liberia, I believe, has come out and said that they will not be, that the head of state will not be attending the summit. Obviously, respect the decisions that uh, both, uh, both she and if other leaders decide the same thing, uh, need to make to address this crisis. Uh, we expect no changes to the summit agenda or security protocols. Uh, we are working to arrange a meeting between Health and Human Services Secretary Burwell, CDC officials, and the heads of delegations of the affected countries on the margins of the summit. I had got asked this yesterday if there were any plans to discuss it. No, well, I'm less interested. I mean, I, just I, mean, I am interested that. in that, but yeah. my question is more to the point is, is there any concern that with people coming in, even if they're not the heads of state, but with the delegations coming in from countries that may have had this, that is there any, is there a health concern about there's this? There's not. The CDC has stated there's no okay. significant risk in the U.S. from the current Ebola outbreak. Obviously, we're monitoring the situation. Well, there's no significant risk because there are few people who Including could, I mean, from those got, traveling for the summit. Including from uh -huh. that. Okay. That's true. Uh, we right. will continue monitoring the situation. Uh, and also to ensure minimal risk, the CDC is alerting healthcare workers in the U.S. and reminding them if there are people that once here uh, exhibit signs that they know how to deal with that. Right. I just have one question about Kurdistan, and I'm sorry, I must go because I have an emergency situation. Okay. Really appreciate it. Thank okay. you. So on July 28, uh, spokesperson Jen Psaki said that all Kurdish oil exports need to go through the central government. Uh, you've repeated that as well. Yet on July 30, like yesterday, uh, Brett McGurk, the Deputy Assistant Secretary mm -hmm. uh, in charge of Iraq policy, tweeted that questions about Iraq's oil exports must be resolved, quote-unquote, in a manner consistent with the Iraqi constitution, and that, quote again, there is no U.S. ban on the transfer or sale of oil originating from any part of Iraq. Correct. I'm now totally confused, really. What is the U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis oil from Kurdistan and Iraq? On the one, on the one hand, John Saki says it has to go through the central government. There's on no, the other hand, Brad no McGurk says there is no U.S. ban on oil from any part right. of Iraq those to be sold. Th those two things aren't inconsistent here. Mm -hmm. So uh, our policy on this issue has been clear and consistent. Iraq's energy resources belong to all of the Iraqi people. Uh, these questions should be resolved in a manner consistent with the Iraqi constitution. There is no U.S. ban on the transfer or sale of, or of oil originated from any part of Iraq. Yeah. Uh, as in many cases involving legal disputes, however, the U.S. Re recommends the parties make their own decisions with advice of counsel. We've told them there could be legal consequences. And, and would also emphasize that this, that particularly the situation we've seen recently, uh, demonstrates why it's really incumbent on Baghdad and Erbil to come together and find a negotiated resolution to this issue so you don't see more legal issues like have arisen. So are you saying that, that you, uh, there is no U.S. ban on oil from Kurdistan um, from any part of Iraq. From any there, part of Kurdistan. There is For no example, Kurdistan. U.S. ban on the transfer or sale of oil originated from any part of Iraq. I okay, don't know how much should, clearer there, I can be. But on the other hand, there must be. Uh, like approval of the central government for any oil export or sale. As, as That's what you were saying, right? We have said these, this issue, Iraq's oil belongs to all the people of Iraq. Okay. Which is why these decisions need to be made uh, in a manner consistent with Iraq's constitution. Why Baghdad and Erbil need to come to a decision on how they're going but to work this out. Just my question was, should Kurdistan get the approval from the central government before exporting it or not? So, must or like Erbil and Baghdad need to find a resolution to this Situation, mm -hmm. period. There is no ban. If the oil is been taken out by the Kurds mm -hmm. to um, to help them towards independence and, and stuff like that, and they sell it to the U.S. or to people in the U.S., is that not illegal? Well, illegal under U.S. law. Well, you're taking. I mean, the money is being the the, the oil is being sold then illegally because it's not as he said not going through the central government. Right, we have, is going this isn't a legal issue, this is a policy issue. We have so told different parties in Iraq that if they attempt to do things like we've seen recently, there could be legal ramifications. That we believe the oil of Iraq belongs to all of the people of Iraq.
Do we have anything else on Gaza, or did we sufficiently? Yeah, can I change the U.S. Africa Leader Summit really quickly? Uh -huh. At this point, the only delegation or the only head of state that you confirm who is not coming due to the Ebola virus is Liberia. Are there any others? That no, that's my understanding. I know there's been some question about some others. I'm happy. We're happy to continue. Sierra Leone, I believe, has said that they're yeah, not coming. I can check if we have that confirmed. Could you get a list out to us of all the head of states who will be attending? We can. We okay. can attempt to get that out to you. Yes. Thanks. Uh -huh. Gaza. I guess Al Jazeera has been reporting that Kerry and Ban Ki Moon have been working on a 72 hour ceasefire to be announced. As I said, uh, when asked about 24 hours, that there's a number of different ways this could look. The Secretary has been working very closely with the UN. Uh, and again, if we can get something in place as soon as possible, uh, the announcement will come from the Secretary. So when you said there's been progress, but it's hard to quantify, that applies to this no matter the duration. It's the same deal. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yes. Can we change subject? We can. Um, the Washington Post reported today about a computer glitch in the U.S. State Department's visa and passport mm -hmm. record keeping. Uh-oh. Well, <laughs> they reported today. That's what I remember. <laughs> and um, so the question is, uh, what has been done? How serious is yes. this? Because some of the uh, apparently this is affecting people who are seeking to adopt children. Well, it's, so it's affecting people all over the world, but let, we have talked about it a little bit. Let me give a little bit of an update. We are continuing to work to restore our visa system to full functionality. We anticipate it will take weeks to restore full visa processing capacity. We have prioritize, been prioritizing immigrant visas, including adoption cases. So there's a backlog, but we are prioritizing adoption cases. So far, we have been able to issue most cases with, of those cases with few delays. Uh, nearly all passports are currently being issued within our customer service standards, even despite the system problems. And we are able to issue passports for emergency travel. Matt, you had asked yesterday, I think Matt asked about numbers. Backlog. Or back, right, numbers of backlog, though. Um, to give you an idea of the progress and sort of the challenges, from the start of the operational issues on July 20th uh, through July 28th, we issued more than 180,000 non-immigrant visas globally. Based on our average production figures, we would have anticipated issuing closer to uh, 370,000 in that same time period. All right. So we're so, you know, virtually cut it in, in half. Fact, in fact, there's yeah. been significant improvement since the last time you updated about it, this, uh, updated us about this, which was, what's today, Thursday, I, which was like Monday or yeah, Tuesday. There, there ha we continue to make improvements, but there is quite a significant backlog, and we are not yet working at full functionality. So, but, okay, so can you, quant not maybe not quantify it, but if you had like some kind of a meter between when this first became an issue mm -hmm. uh, on, the on the 20th, 20th. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the basically kind of catastrophic failure where everything mm -hmm. was down, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and now, mm -hmm. you know, where are you on that? 50 percent, 60, 70 uh, percent? In Is terms of the to... number we've issued or no, our functionality? No, in terms of how functionality, right. Uh, I of... don't know the answer. Let me see if I can check on Is that. Is this an issue with Oracle? Uh, it is, in part, um, because they are the ones that run the hardware and software, I believe. And they, they're dealing with it, or is this something that's... We are working part? together to deal with it. It is uh, <clears throat> limited in part by our outdated software and hardware, which we are attempting to work to fix. Can we move on to... I'll let yes. someone else go. We, no, let's, Matt, I want to talk. I want to talk about these uh, talking points that the White House um, okay. <laughs> inadvertently put out on the torture report. Uh -huh. um, first of all, just in general on this, it, it they suggest that ambassadors in these in the countries where these black sites were were told not were instructed not to inform the State Department about uh, or the Secretary of State about what was going on there. Do you know, is, is this a kind of, is this a normal practice where ambassadors are instructed not to, to withhold certain information from secretaries of state on this or any other issue? Well, let me say, first of all, the talking points and the Q&A contained within those uh, don't represent the views of the State Department. We're not, excuse me, we're not fully vetted within the State Department uh, in terms of the number of people that needed to see them. In fact, very few people saw them before they erroneously sent them to the NSC. So the information contained in them, I'm obviously not going to speak to until a now classified report is released publicly and we can have a conversation then. But I do want to make clear that the talking points and the information contained in them uh, don't represent uh, the views of the State Department and I'm sure we'll be having conversations about this once it is in fact declassified and released. What, what, what do they represent then? Well, I'm sure the person who wrote them and who represented their personal opinion um, look, the administration. So wait, wait. This is this is the opinion. This is the personal. You're saying that these talking points are the personal opinion of one person. No, I'm not saying that. Oh. I'm saying that broadly speaking, 
the Secretary, Secretary Kerry, and this department uh, are proud of the CIA, uh, are proud of the work it's done to keep us safe, uh, and to support our diplomats, not just in Washington, but all over the world. I think the fact that uh, we are willing to acknowledge past mistakes and to learn from them is really what makes, I would say, our country great, but also the CIA unique among intelligence services, and that this administration has been clear uh, that we did not support the detention interrogation practices. That's why we ended them. Again, not these points were very draft points that had been drafted by someone in this building and not vetted through the process that this normally goes through, and therefore don't represent the consensus view of the State Department or the people here. Okay, but now you've just re opened a big can of worms here. The, how, how many years did it take the CIA, did it take the United States to admit that it was involved in the 1953 coup in Iran? I'm not sure why that's relevant to this discussion. Well, you say that this is why the CIA is great, and, and you know, there, there I are said plenty the of fact that, that we are willing to admit past mistakes and course correct is an important uh, principle that we in this government okay. and certainly it the often intelligence takes a long time. For well, you can take that up with whoever was in charge right. of the CIA so anyway, in 1953, Matt. Let's, let's, let's maybe forget. not take it up with me. <laughs> okay, that, I guess that's fair enough. Um, but on the but on my question actually, which is not really related. I mean, it's well, if it's somewhat included, related. If it's included in a document, well, let me just say, can wait, you say that it is not policy? It is, or I'm it is not, not going to comment in any way in anything contained in that document about a classified report that has not been declassified. We will have full discussions, I'm sure, about the issues brought up when it is released to the public. In, in, as a general, so I'm not going to answer your question. As a as a general principle, and which will be soon, by the way. As a general principle, our ambassadors do ambassadors frequently withhold information from their bosses back in Washington. I'm just not Washington. even going to comment on anything that you are bringing All up right. in that session. Secondly, there seems, to be, there seems to be some concern, and this is outside of the, outside of the realm of this, about security at embassies, about potential threats to the U.S. once, when and if this report is released. Um, can you speak to that at all? Do you know if there have been requests made to, in, in anticipation of this of this report coming out in the next, whenever it is, but it, soon, relatively soon? soon. Mm -hmm. Has there been any um, uh, in, in increased, enhanced security requests to various countries <clears throat> for for uh, for embassies? Uh, I'm I'm happy to check on that, Matt. Obviously, uh, we are constantly looking at the security picture, and if we think there are. Uh, situations where an additional threat might arise, we would take steps and we would look at that very closely. Uh, we know this is an issue that not just in the United States, quite frankly, but all over the world, uh, is uh, a quite contentious one. Uh, we want to do everything we can to protect our people. That is our top priority. Uh, we believe it's important to be as transparent as possible in talking about things like this and releasing uh, these kinds of information when we can. But again, we'll take security concerns into account and we'll probably have more of that discussion again over the coming days. Let's, yeah, let's go to India, actually, and let's go to some folks who haven't had one, and then we'll go to Afghanistan. Just, just uh, two quick clarifications from the joint uh, uh, press conference by Secretary Kerry and Sushma Samraj. One was both were confused or were not, you know, about the WTO negotiations going on in, uh, and so, yeah. What is the latest status? Do you have anything update on that? I don't have anything to add to what they said. I'm happy to check with particularly our USTR colleagues and my, my uh, team here to see if we can send you something. Because they were saying that the uh, negotiations are going on, and then they said, no, they concluded, so you know what. Let me get some clarity And the for second you on one is on the sanctions against Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the State Department feeling that uh, India's stand will be? Because of the long, you know, well, friendship. I, I don't think we're going to speak for the Indian government on this one. No, how, like, uh, did did the secretary, you know, uh, ask the India to support the sanctions? Or um, I can check again. I should check with the team on the ground. They have the latest information. Okay. Let's Thanks. go here, and then we'll go to Afghanistan. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask about North Korea. Uh huh. Kenneth Bay had an interview um, in which he said he feels that the U.S. government has abandoned him. Assuming that his um, comments have been relate accurately, what's your response? Has he been abandoned? Well, no. Uh, just a couple updates. We are in regular contact with Mr. Bay's family. We last spoke with his family yesterday on July 20th. Uh, and we are, of course, very concerned about his health. Uh, we have urged the DPRK authorities to grant him special amnesty and immediate release on humanitarian grounds. And look, I would just, you know, take with a grain of salt things people say in videos when they're being held by a country like North Korea. Sure. Um, do you have any updates on any of the other two? I don't have detainees? any updates on that for you. And then uh, Glenn Davies and Bob King were on the Hill yesterday. Um, they faced a lot of frustrated questions from Congress about 
the lack of uh, fruit that's been yielded by current U.S. North Korea policy. Do you have? Is there any t talk about perhaps shifting toward a more pro-engagement stance with North Korea? Not that I've heard. Not that I've heard. I, I'm happy to check with them and see if there's anything to add to what they said on the Hill. Hmm. Do you think that the time might be ripe, though, given that there's, you have Japan potentially making mm -hmm. progress with North Korea on a bilateral human rights issue? You have um, a North Korea, a, a South Korean, excuse me, president, mm -hmm. who is uh, sort of running out of time to make some tangible progress on North Korea. You have uh, China increasingly very. Uh, frustrated with the lack of traction it's gotten in mm -hmm. its attempts to restart talks. And then you have a rising chorus domestically mm -hmm. saying that there's been no progress with U.S. policy. No, it's, North Korea. It's, it's not an unfair uh, question or an easy one to answer, I think. But let me um, talk to our folks. And I just don't have all the granularity here. And let me see if we can get you some. Thanks. Well, follow up uh, question about Kenneth Fair. When, uh, when does the last time uh, Kenneth Fair's families uh, met him at the North Korea? Uh, well, I know that Swedish embassy representatives have met with him 11 times since his detention, most recently on April 18th. The Swedish. So since, since after April 18, doesn't meet any. Not to my anything. knowledge, no. So they rejected the meeting or what? I, I don't have details on that for you. Right, thank you. Well, yeah. now, Madam, I'm just going back to your statement, what you said about uh, UN audits and all those mm -hmm. things. And people, because people in Afghanistan are still confused. They have no president or they have no government and uh, functioning. But my question is that, uh, one, what role the U.S. is playing as far as these audits are mm -hmm. concerned? And two, if these two candidates now are ready to form the government or if they have accepted the audit? Well, they, they do still have a government in place. Let's be clear. President Karzai is still president of Afghanistan. Uh, we have urged the candidates to continue to demonstrate leadership, uh, to try to get here to an, a legitimate outcome of this election. Uh, we want them to instruct their teams to participate fully in the audit when it resumes on August 2nd. Just some statistics here. All ballot boxes from 24 of the 34 provinces have been transported to the IEC. More than 17,000 uh, ballot boxes are at the IEC. This is 75% of the total. Uh, 55 USAID implementing partner observers are in country, expected to reach 73, I think, by today. Uh, they took a pause for the Eid holiday to allow staff to celebrate with their families. They'll be doing training on July 31st and August 1st, and the audit will resume on August 2nd. We do hope that the audit will be completed by the end of August. We know that the candidates would like the process to be completed, and a president inaugurated in time for the NATO summit that will be taking place in Wales. Uh, but the summit's not a deadline. We just know that the parties would like it to be resolved by then. And both candidates, as we, as we have said, have consistently indicated they will sign the bilateral security agreement soon as a priority after their inauguration. Thank you. Ukraine. Yep. Um, so it looks as though, well, that doesn't look as though, it is the case that the uh, at least some investigators made it Correct. to the crash site this morning. I'm wondering if you have anything to say about that. And are there, do you have any people there? there so we are pleased that OSCE monitors with Dutch and Australian investigators were able to finally gain access to the crash site today. Uh, they had some difficulties getting there, but they did gain access. I don't think we have anyone there. Okay. I'm happy to check. Does that mean that you believe the Poroshenko slash um, uh, pro separatist uh, or the, the ceasefire, whatever, however you want to describe it, that mm -hmm. around the crash site is working? Well, we have welcomed his announcement of a unilateral ceasefire. Uh, we have called on the Russian backed separatists to honor it. Uh, we've seen there's still some fighting in the area. Uh, we saw today that uh, a group of separatists were trying to prevent access, fired on the Ukrainian security forces who were escorting the convoy. So it's still a challenging security environment. So you're not yet you're not yet satisfied with the with with this with, with the situation as it exists in terms of security at the crash site. There's more that needs to be done. Okay, and and there was some reports yesterday about landmines being. Place. Do you know yeah, we couldn't confirm. We could not, and still cannot right. confirm those reports. I saw those as well. Now, uh, for the last couple of days, you've been asked about um, the the Ukrainian military's counter counterterrorism operation or operations that are out going after the separatists in areas of South and East Ukraine, um, and you've been asked about civilian casualties. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday, you said, "Yeah, uh, yes, you are, are concerned about civilian casualties in all these cases, but you're not sure." Um, you know, who, if, if they're firing these, these 
Right, these we are, are, this artillery we or not. Don't is that granularity on all the details. Still not. So you do on Gaza. You're pretty sure you know what's going on in Gaza because of the UN and because of the Israeli statements. We've, but we've but presented with but presented with accounts from the civilians in the southeast of Ukraine. We're, what you've seen, we're working to verify them, Matt. So you, you can't yet verify that there have been a what you would consider to be an unacceptably unacceptably high level of civilian casualties. Correct. We cannot confirm that. But you just because to make sure. Well, but make sure. Well, no, well, hold wait, on, no, on. Let me tell you why we can't, though, because that's important. Because many of these are reported to be happening in Russian separatist-controlled area, which we just have much less visibility of. Uh, often. Okay, but I mean that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not happening. But we can't confirm them either. So, you, well, we confirm them. We've right. seen the reports, and but it's sure they I'm, would be concerning. Okay, but, but unless you know. I'm unless I'm mistaken, you haven't absolutely confirmed that it was Israeli shells that hit the which hit is, the UN which is school. Why I said what I said today. Right, in exactly. The way I said it. But, okay, but anyway, it is still a concern civilian casualties on both sides of the Ukraine conflict, as it is. Civilian elsewhere. casualties are always a concern, but the Ukrainian government has shown remarkable restraint here. <clears> I okay, know. and. Uh, are you yet willing uh, – well, that's a bad way to put it. Have you seen any sign yet that the sanctions that were imposed, going back all the way as far as mm -hmm. the annexation of Crimea, but up to and including the sanctions that were just announced the other day, yes. that have you seen any sign that those have had an impact on President Putin or the Russian government's decision-making as it relates to Ukraine, as it relates to support for the – what you your, uh, the support for the separatists in terms of what you say is – the movement of heavy weapons and the artillery shell. We have continued to see the Russians supporting the separatists. So, in other words, the sanctions have not had well, an this, impact. Well, this isn't a yes or no proposition here. There's a no. long-term strategic calculus that President Putin undoubtedly is making right now, and right. I can't predict whether or not in his head at this moment it is having an impact. But not yet. You haven't seen... We haven't seen so the situation on the ground change. Because okay? of the sanctions or because of anything else? Because of anything. Right. I mean, if, if President Putin is you, willing to drive okay. his economy into the ground, Make that decision. But that's a pretty bold decision to be making for the people of Russia. Do you have um, any new evidence of the shelling that you say is coming from the Russian side and the um, shipments of weaponry We to the did, separatists? let's see, as of July 26, which is a few days ago now, we had seen addi two additional battalion tactical groups in the Rostov area, which is 50 kilometers from the Ukrainian border. That has brought the total number of U Russian uh, battle battalion tactical groups deployed near the border to at least 16. Uh, that's something we've been watching. But that's in Russia. Correct. Right, but they're right. deployed near the border. I'm right. just noting some of the things oh, okay. we've seen lately. We uh, continue to see shipments. You continue to see shipments mm -hmm. across the border and the shelling, too? Uh, I that? can check on the shelling. Right. Anything else? Argentina. I have a few little bits, actually. Okay. Argentina. Yeah. Um, so there was a very complicated and yes. long legal battle, which uh. ended last night with um, Argentina officially going into default. Mm -hmm. Um, after talks between two with two huge hedge funds to play off their to accept a write down on Argentine bonds failed, mm -hmm. um, top uh, Argentine leaders are actually accusing the United States of having a hand in this and creating the conditions in which um, this happened by not allowing a U.S. but because a U.S. court ruled that uh, Buenos Aires couldn't service its restructured debt. Um, by, without paying off the hedge funds in full. Do you accept any responsibility? Has the United States, uh, as a government, been involved in these well, dis discussions we, at all? Well, uh, we made our position clear in this litigation and the amicus briefs that were filed in this case. Uh, we had made a number of fairly complicated financial arguments, but the bottom line here was that the Second Circuit rejected the United States arguments and the Supreme Court denied review of the lower court's decision. You know, I can't speculate on what Argentina would do next, but it really is an, a, an issue for Argentine authorities. Uh, and representatives of their creditors t for their views on the way forward. Uh, we do think they've made some, some good progress towards meeting their obligations. Uh, we believe it's in their interest to normalize relations with all of its creditors. Over the past year, we have observed Argentina's settlement of investment disputes, noted its preliminary efforts to address deficiencies in its reporting to the IMF, and welcomed excuse me, its recent payments to the U.S. government and Paris Club creditors. The resolution of the bondholder litigation would, of course, build upon this positive trend. But you don't see any responsibility for the United States, per se, mm -mm. behind what happened no. with the Argentine, the Argentine going to default. And I have more if there's nothing on that. I think there's one at the end, but just let's uh, Azerbaijan, I wondered if you had um, 
anything on um, two human rights activists, Layla mm -hmm. and Arif Yunus. They're a couple <coughs> who have been charged with treason. Um, they were accused of spying for Armenia. I saw those reports. I don't have anything on that. We may have more to say on that later, though. Okay. So I'll check in with you on that. Let's bring us home. Last one. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, Peter Harrell was in Seoul earlier this week, and he was reported to have asked South Korea to uh, join efforts to impose sanctions on Russia. I'm wondering what specific role do you want South Korea to play in this? Well, we certainly talk, we talk with South Korea all the time and coordinate with them on sanctions on a host of countries. Uh, we've talked to a number of partners about increasing the pressure on Russia. This was part of that normal outreach, but we believe that the more countries that uh, impose costs on Russia, the more effective those sanctions are, the more people you get on board for them. This is part of those discussions. Can I go back to the talk one very brief second, of course you torture can. things. I, I, I know you won't answer questions related to it, but are you saying when you say this is a this is a draft, not reviewed, that, that nothing that's in this these four pages are going to appear in in, in after the report comes no, out? No, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm just so saying. in other words, there is stuff in here, and 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 comments made or responses prepared, questions presume anticipated that could be in fact. That's true. What it, it, turns it is a, up it is a very act. early draft of a document that is going to go through many, many, many layers of review here. Um, again, it just doesn't represent uh, the position of this department and what we should say publicly. Some of it may look similar when we get there eventually, but some of it may not. Uh, so in other words, it, it could be just not yet. So you're not no. going to say that nothing in here is <laughs> going to actually, is no. actually going to make it. You're not no. saying that absolutely everything in here is not going to make the cut. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying specifically the top lines that were right. uh, presented as the State Department position uh, do not represent that uh, position. Some of it may be in there when we get there, and some of it may not. Okay, the, 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 just the top lines. What about the, the questions well, that, that, that you that, that those weren't represented as being State Department questions? Okay. I'm well, could you answer this this one? I'm not going to answer any of the questions in that document now until that the, the report, report is has. Well, the report hasn't been released or declassified yet. Okay. So but we can it, have that conversation after it is. Well, let me just let me just put, put it this way. Is the White House prepared to concede that people were tortured? Now, pr pr prior to the release Matt, of the report. Matt, I'm not even going to get into this discussion. The President has been very clear about his feelings on this. He's spoken at length about it as a candidate and as the President. I do not have anything to add to those comments. 